So in this video, we're going to walk through the major historical events in the history of life on Earth. We think that Earth formed about 4.6 billion years ago, according to evidence from radiome radiometric dating, or sort of the, the very stable uh, decay rate of radioactive atoms. Um, we think that Earth formed with the rest of the solar system, um, and that maybe there's no fossil evidence of life for about a billion years. So if, if there is no life for about the first billion years of Earth's history, and then suddenly there is life, how did life get started? Uh, we don't know would be the short answer to that question. We'll try and uh, talk a little bit more about what we might think in class. Uh, but where I want to start this video is just sort of a theoretical construct called the last universal common ancestor to all modern life. Um, what do we think was true of, of the group of cells that led to all the diversity of life we see today? Um, you can see that these are very simple characteristics. This is probably very similar to some extent to the prokaryotic cells that we see today. Some kind of master DNA code that could be copied by RNA to help make proteins, very basic metabolic pathways that help it make energy um, and uh, reproduce itself, some kind of membrane to control what goes in and out. Um, and we think that life started in the oceans for reasons that we will discuss here in just a minute. So what happened after that? Um, we think that there were several early adaptations that helped organisms um, better survive to reproduce. Um, cellular respiration was something that might have even come about before the last universal common ancestor to all um, li uh, modern life. Um, so you can imagine that certainly the ability to take organic compounds and, and cut them up to, to release energy to power cellular work um, doing that as efficiently as possible would help you survive better and reproduce more offspring. Um, so the glycolysis pathway, the citric acid cycle, the electron transport chain, um, all of these evolved very early because we see all of these abilities in all life, including bacteria. So the only thing that's um, kind of in this little part of the video, whoops, let me go back, um, that we would not expect to see um, in these earliest of organisms would be oxygen. Um, the use of oxygen in order to be the final electron acceptor. We wouldn't expect to see that because um, we don't see any evidence of oxygen existing um, very early on, and we'll, we'll justify where it came from then and, and how we know that. Um, so the earliest bacteria and even some modern anaerobic bacteria still use other compounds to be the final electron acceptor, um, like, say, iron or other compounds. Okay, so if, if oxygen, if molecular oxygen didn't exist early, um, so I'm talking about O2 here, not just the atom oxygen, um, where did it come from? We think it came from autotrophs. Um, autotrophy itself might have evolved earlier, um, but finally some form of autotrophy involved that involves splitting water, like in modern photosynthesis and chemosynthesis, uh, and the splitting of water to give electrons back to, um, in photosynthesis, a pigment, um, generates molecular oxygen. And so this sort of byproduct oxygen finally starts to build up, um, in the oceans first until it saturates and then it fills the air. And that really is a revolutionary event for lots of reasons. Um, so first of all, how do we even know that, that oxygen didn't come about until much, much later? Um, we don't see any evidence of iron oxide or rust in earlier geologic uh, um, uh, layers. So we finally start to see rust, um, and thus we infer that oxygen finally came about later. And why was that so important in the history of life? Um, well, first of all, it might have triggered the first mass extinction, because oxygen is a very reactive molecule. Um, we all mostly use oxygen in the final, as the final electron acceptor in respiration, um, but probably that came about first um, almost as like a defense mechanism to turn it into harmless water. Um, it was also, um, that final step also helped generate more ATP, so, so it was useful in several regards. Um, but the other thing that oxygen did when it filled the air is that oxygen O2 can turn into ozone very high up. Ozone is actually O3. We know that the ozone layer helps um, block um, a lot of UV radiation from penetrating further on land or in the water. And if, if water sort of afforded its own protection to some extent from, from um, mutagenic um, DNA damaging UV radiation, what we really think the ozone layer's formation did is it made life on land possible. All right. So um, really, this is just a classic example of how organisms can fundamentally change the environment themselves. Great. 
So let's talk about the origin of eukaryotic cells. Um, we think that eukaryotic cells are actually derived from prokaryotes. Um, we think that perhaps some prokaryotes got so large that they needed to um, still do additional things to help maximize their surface area to volume ratio. Remember that bigger cells aren't necessarily better. So perhaps they started forming these highly folded um, cell membrane um, structures to help maximize their surface area to volume ratio inside. Um, so they maybe formed simple organelles like things like the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, the nucleus. Um, we think that other organelles, like say the mitochondrion and the chloroplast, actually came about when like maybe a bigger prokaryote swallowed a smaller prokaryote um, and they actually decided to um, work together. So sort of an internal symbiotic relationship between two organisms um, within the larger organism. Maybe that smaller bacterium was really good at doing cellular respiration and could make ATP for both organisms. Maybe the larger organism could afford the smaller organism more protection. Um, we think that this maybe occurred multiple times in history because all eukaryotes now have mitochondria and maybe future autotrophic eukaryotes also acquired photosynthetic bacteria and sort of um, did another internal symbiosis with them. Um, why do we think those two organelles and not others? Because mitochondria and chloroplasts have their own DNA code and ribosomes inside. The DNA is in the shape of a circular chromosome, just like bacteria. They do a binary fission-like um, cell division, just like bacteria. So they really are just like little tiny bacteria inside of us, um, which I hope is kind of fun to think about, bacteria crawling around inside of you right now. Um, of course, we've already talked about how they're on you, like um, the bacteria on your skin serving as a type of immune defense. They're also lining your digestive tract, um, helping you digest food. Um, so yeah, now they're inside of you too. Kind of exciting. Um, eukaryotic cells existed for hundreds of millions of years before we finally start to see multicellular eukaryotes. Um, you have to be eukaryotic to be multicellular, although not all modern eukaryotes are multicellular. So there are still single-celled eukaryotes like yeast and amoeba, okay? But um, for whatever reason, we've never found multicellular prokaryotes. Um, if you were to ask me why, I have no idea. Um, how did multicellularity arise? I have no idea. Uh, we think that perhaps um, we see lots of evidence of, of organisms kind of grouping together in colonies and kind of hanging out. Um, but how you go from that to sort of staying together, perhaps, and producing offspring that start out single-celled but then grow to the multicellular form, um, I really don't know how to think about how that might have um, arisen. Um, but maybe hundreds of millions of years after that, we finally start to see sophisticated um, organisms, plants, fungi, animals, and the colonization of land. Um, it's probably likely that bacteria colonized land long before this, uh, but if we're thinking about sort of the, the diversity of life we now see on land, we think that perhaps plants and fungi went first. Remember that we talked about the importance of uh, mycorrhizal relationships um, between fungi and plant roots to help plants get soil nutrients and water and support, um, and the plants feed those fungi. So they probably helped each other, and then animals came much later. Um, sort of arthropod bugs and vertebrates dominate animal life on land currently, um, and the arthropods definitely went first. So vertebrates came much later, and um, I just want to end this video by just kind of talking about what about us? Um, if, if you're interested in thinking about humans, uh, we find anatomically modern human fossils maybe somewhere around 200,000 years ago, um, and where might that be on the scale? Um, very close to present day. How close to present day? Uh, if you were to um, divide that out, you'd find that maybe modern humans have only been um, existing for about four thousandths of a percent of Earth's overall history. Or if you were to convert that, um, let's say we take the whole scale of, of Earth's history and convert it into a calendar year, um, we would maybe come on the scene about 23 minutes ago in the overall calendar year or something like um, if Earth started on January 1st, um, then we would show up um, on New Year's Eve about 20 minutes to midnight. So we have not been on this planet very long, um, and um, um, that's fun to think about when you think the overall history of life.